Welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast, where mental health professionals share information and perspectives that illuminate, educate, and is worthy of a mental note. And now your host, Chris Quarto. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast. I'm your host, Chris Quarto. Before I give you my mental health tip of the week, I wanted to let you know that the Make a Mental Note podcast will be coming to an end in the next month. I have loved doing this podcast series, but it's time to move on and do something different. And that something is a new podcast series that involves people who want to start a private practice. And that's my little teaser. And I'll share more as the time grows nearer to the launch of the new podcast. But suffice to say that things are in motion and I'm really excited for you to hear what I've got in store for 2017. Well, my mental health tip for the week has to do with dealing with loss. You know, it's a fact of life that losses happen, some of which are more significant than others. Here's a quote from Vicki Harrison regarding grief resulting from loss. Grief is like the ocean. It comes on waves, ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water is calm, and sometimes it's overwhelming. All we can do is learn to swim. Isn't that great? This really seems to capture the, um, the inner experience of loss and, and that there's no choice but to figure out a way to deal with it. And of course, there are lots of ways of dealing with loss and there's no right way of doing it. One mental health tip, which would probably happen after you deal with the emotional impact of the loss, is to find meaning in it. For example, to stop, um, examine, and appreciate what really matters. You know, what's important, what's truly valuable in life. To, to use the loss as a way to learn and to evolve and make a difference in the world. Now, these are just a few things that might help you deal with loss, and it's obviously a process. But I'm no expert in this area, which is why I invited my podcast guest, Ajeta Robinson, to talk about this on today's Make a Mental Note podcast episode. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Quarto, and welcome again to the Make a Mental Note podcast. Today, I am joined by Ajeta Robinson, who is a licensed clinical professional counselor in Maryland. And Ajeta, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, sure. Well, why don't you start off by telling the uh, mental note-taking audience a little bit about who you are and what you do for a living, Ajeta? Sure. I am a licensed uh, clinical professional counselor. I am also a counselor educator, which means I um, have a PhD in counseling education. All right. I had a group private practice uh, called Friends in Transition in Bethesda, Maryland, and I am also an assistant professor at Argus University DC campus. So busy um, with both teaching and seeing clients and, and direct practice. Um, and so that's a little bit about where I am located. Um, my substantive area of expertise clinically um, is grief and trauma. All right. so I work with from that perspective really across the lifespan. Um, All and right. So that's a little bit about the work that I, I am doing. Okay, that sounds great. So you're very busy. You're doing a lot of different things. And uh, it's wonderful that you can kind of have that, uh, I guess, that balance of doing the practice and, and doing the, uh, the teaching as well. And I, and I would suspect that having the teaching or having the practice kind of keeps your skills sharp so you can maybe be a better educator. Would you say that that's right? Absolutely. It definitely informs the what's happening in the classroom and being able to talk to students um, about what I'm experiencing and seeing in the field, especially as we're working with adolescents and other populations where there's constantly new and emerging trends or um, buzzwords or things of that nature that we, we need to be aware of when we're connected to the clients that we are committed to serving. It really enriches the way that we can train other mental health clinicians. It also shows up in the way that um, I construct my research projects. It's really informed. I can go back to uh, clients or other participants um, and really hone in on what their lived experience is. And so it's not just what's coming up in my academic brain, 
um, I'm seeing it in the field. And so then we'll go and we'll, we'll in a research perspective, um, we'll, we'll see, is this something that is a trend or a phenomenon that's happening? Mm. And then ultimately, what does that mean to how we prepare clinicians to really serve um, more effectively and, and competently the population that we, we say that we're committed to serving? That's wonderful. Well, I'm going to want you to talk a little bit about grief and, and transitions. I know that that's one of your areas of expertise. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about you and, and how you decided to enter the helping profession. And maybe you could share with the mental note takers what motivated you to go uh, into, into this field. What's your story, Ajeta? Well, I'll be honest, Chris, I ran from it for quite a while. I did a lot of different things um, because grief is heavy lifting, and it just kept landing back in my lap. I had a business degree. I, I went to law school for a little while. I really, really huh. ran from this work. Uh-huh. Um, and it was when I stopped running, I realized it was right where I needed to be. Um, one of my earliest experiences was I was around eight or so. I had my very first experience working with a therapist. So it was actually a, um, I later learned was a psychologist. Okay. And I remember being fascinated, right? So we would get up in the morning and despite having to be up at six o'clock in the morning to make our eight o'clock appointment, I was absolutely fascinated. She had this huge building in the heart of Los Angeles. Uh-huh. Um, and I kept thinking, how how awesome must her job be if she's willing to come on a Saturday morning? <laughs> and so my eight year old friend was just fascinated by that. Sure. Um, and later, you know, my oldest niece, we figured out at the time they had no idea what was going on um, with my oldest niece, but we ultimately found out that she um, had autism. Oh. Okay. Um, she had had several surgeries and, you know, misdiagnoses, and they finally kind of figured it out. And I remember watching um, my brother and my sister-in-law at the time um, really struggle and navigate these different systems of care. Mm -hmm. Um, And I got to see that firsthand. And so I really, I knew that this was important work um, to be doing, even at that young of an age. Um, And so I ran for it for a while because it also looked like a lot of responsibility. And could I sit with people in the midst of for some, their darkest time and their witness to those experiences. Um, And eventually I I ended up right right in that place Um, through internship. I kept getting placed with kids and families that were grieving. And I I kept at the time thinking, what luck am I having? What luck is this? And then I was good at it. I was good at just being able to be with people. Ah. And so I gave myself permission to sit and really think about that. Um, And when I slowed down enough, I realized that I really enjoyed being able to walk with people on that journey. And so Mm. that's how I got here. That's how I got here. Interesting. That that slowing down enough shows up um, very much so in in what I, I do and the work that I do with clients. On, on their own journeys in this work. Now, yeah, interesting how our personal experiences have a, a huge impact on career decision. Absolutely. If we get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about your, your work that you do um, in Maryland at your, uh, at your clinic. Mm-hmm. So it is a group practice. I have five other clinicians that are here. Right. And the common thing um, we we specialize in grief and loss as a whole, um, whether that is symbolic losses, so divorce, changing schools, changing jobs, um, or the physical losses. So someone has physically died or we have lost a limb or we've lost our homes, which can be both physical and symbolic in some ways. And so we really um, honor where people are in their lives, in their grief journey. Um, we're also very committed to making sure that um, we are culturally sensitive and responsive to the ways in which people encounter this work, what mm. brings them here, what type of, of work or intervention is required so that they can see improvement. But right. above all else, we really hold up and amplify that people are the experts in their lives. Right? Sometimes we've lost sight of our voice mm-hmm. and we've lost sight of ourselves, but that we are capable of remedy our situations in most cases um 
if we receive the support that we need to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the fundamental guiding principles behind the work that we do, is that we empower people to step back into the role where they feel that they are the expert. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do that through compassion and self-acceptance. And so that's a lot of the, the space that we are very intentional about creating with and for clients here. Yeah, I, yeah, and I suppose that a, a lot of clients like the fact that you put them in the role of the expert, where in in some cases, uh, the clinician would put themselves in the in the role of an expert. But it's quite different from from how you're approaching it. And why did you decide to kind of approach it that way, Ajeta? You know, part of it is um, it's I think it's the reality of what's actually happening, right? And so as a clinician, I had knowledge and skills and experience, but there's this huge part of a client that I will never have access to um, in the way they do. Right. And, and being able to partner with clients is also an, a, a, a great way to um, assist clients in, in being involved in the process, right? By giving them ownership um, helps not only keep them accountable, but allows them to co-create what this experience looks like. And for me, coming to therapy is a very vulnerable experience. And so we try to um, normalize that um, and also give some of that power back because this really feels like a loss of power for some people when mm. they come. For many people, when they come to get to a place where they, they realize or admit um, that whatever they're experiencing, they're, they're not in a position to solve by themselves, that they need support. Um, and so we want to start off in the beginning by giving them um, kudos for for being courageous enough to come in and allow us to partner with them. And so mm-hmm. we keep them right there in the front. For so some clients, depending on when they come in, how devastated they feel that they are or how capable they feel they are, even incapable, they may be quite resentful that we're asking them to be the experts in their lives. Um, and so we we know that, we expect that, we validate and normalize that, that it's scary to have to be in control. Right. And what does it feel like to be able to come to this space and sit some of those things down and to unpack some of the things that we carry on a day-to-day basis that are just heavy? Yeah. Um, and so we really focus on making sure that clients understand and, and, and know that this is a space where it can just be about them. Um in the ways that are healing for them as opposed to that continues to promote vulnerability. Right. Well, you know, I, I always ask my guests about, um, you know, the, the clients and, and themes that they're experiencing. And, um, you know, in this case, there, there's an obvious theme of loss. But I wonder, you know, in your work with these clients, even though they have that as a common theme, is there a similar process that they go through in dealing with the loss, or maybe it's different for different types of losses? Maybe you could speak a little bit about that, Ajeta. Sure. Um, I find that many clients come in frustrated with themselves about how they're navigating the loss. Hmm. There's this narrative around how they're supposed to be grieving that really gets in the way. They're very critical about how well they are grieving, if they're grieving the right way. Okay. Um, Are their loved ones grieving the right way? And so there's this real way that that lack of compassion for self shows up, whether it's a physical or symbolic loss. um, The lack of compassion and self-acceptance about where they are is huge. Uh Um, Many clients come in wanting solutions on how they can not feel what they're feeling as opposed to being able to embrace that that's where they are Ah. and being able to slow down enough to slow down enough to just be with themselves because that's tough. We do not encourage that. We're not a society that encourages slowing down and just be. We are a doing that's true society. So it's uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. Um, the other piece that's important that I find um, needing to, to talk to clients about quite repetitively um, is around 
self-care. And it sounds so simple, um, but we are so focused on others, other perceptions for the shoulds, what we should be doing, how we should be doing uh-huh. this, that we often dismiss what we actually need, um, the ways in which we actually need to care for ourselves because it feels selfish. Even in the grief process, um, I have clients that will say, um, I know that my mother or my father or whomever the, the, the deceased is, um, wouldn't want me to, they'd be, they would be embarrassed or they would be upset if they could see me now and how I'm not functioning. And so even in the midst of our own suffering, we are still managing how we're being perceived. And I, and I wonder if sometimes if uh, we're talking about caretakers and they've experienced a loss of the person that they had been taking care of, if um, if they, as the caretaker, have difficulty with the self-care that you're talking about because they almost feel like it's a betrayal of, of some sort, mm-hmm. that, they, that they're caring for themselves when they should be caring for another person or they still haven't really gotten past the, the, the loss of that person. And so they're mm-hmm. still in this mindset I'm almost betraying the person that I'm caring for or that who I did care for. Does that come into the picture at all? It does. And there shows up is the the grief Mm -hmm. um, and the guilt around either not being sad enough or getting back to the day to day and finding themselves laughing and being able to enjoy life and feeling guilty about doing that. Ah. Um, And other and also in other ways, feeling guilty about not being able to pick up the pieces and not knowing what to do next. Um, and I remind, you know, I remind clients um, often that although grief is universal, there's nothing that prepares us for it. And there's no right or wrong way to do it. Right? We often have to combat the myth that time will heal it. And it's just not true for most of us. It might lessen the intensity, but grief is an active process. Some more more physically active for for some of us than others, but it is a doing. Um, It involves us being able to accept and in some ways recreate what our new normal looks like post this loss. Mm -hmm. Um, And being able to acknowledge that the person that we lost, we have to situate them in a different place in our life whether that be spiritual for some people um, or in the, the task that we take on. Um, I find that many clients instead choose to endure or don't believe that they have any other options other than to just endure what's happening. And so they dismiss and diminish the amount of suffering they're actually experiencing, mm. which our society reinforces, right? Think about the ways in which our uh, organizations or our companies treat bereavement leave. Depending on who died, that determines how much leave or how much grieving time off you need. Right. Um, and for some, depending on the relationship, that may not even be a recognized relationship at all um, by some company's policy. And so right. we're encouraged to kind of get back to the pre loss way of life. And, and it's just not the natural way that things are. We're imposing this this way of being on clients. Um, and I find that clients finally, when they do come, some come um, when they, they're they no longer able to carry the weight. Right. Um, and so we go through the process for most of unpacking all of the narratives, all of the shoulds um, that are getting in the way of what their authentic experience is. Well, I guess one of those one of those shoulds that I want to ask you about because you've mentioned this a couple of times, and I've actually had this experience that, that you're talking about where um, I should be grieving in a particular way, uh, and I wonder where does that come from? Where people feel like they have to do it this way, or they have to they have to cry, and if they're not crying, that means that they're not truly grieving and where does all that kind of stuff come from, Ajeta? I think it's social and cultural. Uh-huh. Um, and we see this a lot, right? We see, um, and we know that when we remember our earliest experiences of grief, we remember what other people were doing or not doing or the messages that we receive when we are preparing for a funeral um, is to be strong and, you know, and not to cry and that you're going to be okay um, and that the loved one is in a better place. And we may not actually believe or feel any of those things, but 
because we are still managing our the perception that other people have that we are okay, we behave in ways that might indicate that. We, if crying is an accepted way of expressing emotions, then we might feel free to do so. Sometimes we withhold that because we don't want our children to be afraid or to think that we're not okay. Um, or we aren't able, we're afraid that if we start crying, we won't be able to stop. Um, and so I think we get those messages from a lot of different places, from our, our different cultures that we um, that we belong to, the different social influences, um, even the gender norms around crying um, mm. and emoting. We know that um, generally uh, women tend to, um, to cry um, when they're grieving and to talk about it. And again, generally speaking, men tend to, to do, they tend to go back to work, they tend to mm-hmm. do physical things, um, and we can often miss it. We certainly know that kids get busy, and so they often are grieving in plain sight. And because they are walk, they walk away and they play, um, or they're not articulating it, we often can miss that kids are suffering. Right. And so those are other ways that I talk quite a bit to clients about um, just because it doesn't look like yours doesn't mean that they're grieving, right? We all manage that in our own way, and that the ways in which we, we get those needs met are okay. As long as they aren't harming ourselves or another person, there's no right or wrong way to do grief. Right. So there, so there are differences based on gender. There are differences based on, I guess, developmental level that you were just talking about. And I heard you say a little bit about cultural, too. And I wonder if there are... You know, if you've had uh, enough experiences with people from different cultures to be able to um, to see h- how they react differently to, to losses and transitions. Have you noticed any differences along those lines, Ajeta? Well, I will, I, I've noticed from, a, from my clients who might be more religious um, in um as it relates to their practices and rituals, um, mm-hmm. that there is perhaps more space okay. um, for them to to grieve over a longer period of time. To some right. degree, it's built to the culture. Um, and I will, you know, uh, kind of share one of my own experiences. And um, many of the families, um, or kind of the smaller families, uh, in in my larger family system. There's built in 60 days of mourning, right? And so it's expected. Hmm. Um, and there's this care that's built into that system. Um, we know, depending on who who lost a loved one, um, each week there's a different family member that steps in to make sure that family member has food and that they're cared for. Wow. All of built into the grieving process. What the celebration and, you know, the way that we talk about the funeral, whether it's a celebration or a homegoing ceremony or whatever that is, is it's cultural. Um, the different rituals that we have um, about what it means to send a loved one to the next place if we believe that there's a next place. Right. right? All of that is cultural. Um, and the, the more that I think those things are identified and we know what to expect and we know who's going to be there to support us, I find that we ha- I have clients in those situations that um, are, are more aware of and accepting of their grief and where they are in that process than those that aren't sure or haven't had those experiences or it's not something that families talk about. Right. Um, I find that those are the clients that tend to struggle more because not only are we trying to identify what we're feeling, but at the same time, building the language and capacity to understand what we're feeling. Um, and that can be, that's difficult, that can be difficult work to do when we're already emotionally and mentally compromised um, because of the loss and the feelings that come with that. Um, and so cultural in those ways, and also definitely I think some generational um, mm-hmm. differences in, in what I see. I see more of the, the collective grieving among our adolescents, um, especially when it's a loss that's in their peer group. Yes. Um, they're utilizing social media and they're talking about those things. They're making things like T-shirts and they're very public in some ways with where they are in their grief process. I'm not okay. Um, and so I think in some ways, socially, we are beginning to, ha- to be more transparent about how heavy this work and this lifting is and that it's okay to not be okay and to seek support. And so I think that provides some hope 
um, for those who are suffering, um, as well as those of us who are doing this work that um, we're becoming closer um, to accepting that this is a normal, natural part of life. Right. So we're at this point of the interview that I call the recipe for success. And when you look at your clients, uh, trying to get them from point A when they're first coming in to see you to point B when they've um, gotten to the point where they don't need to see you any longer. I'm kind of curious what happens in between point A and point B. How, how, do, how is it that you kind of move them through the process so they no longer come in to see you? And, and I guess... A part of the question, too, I guess this is the B part of the question. What do you consider to be therapeutic success for people who are experiencing uh, loss and life transitions? Mm-hmm. And so I think that one of the recipes for success for clients that are experiencing loss, but also for clients in general, is self compassion. All right. And it's something that most clients don't come in with. Um, or come in knowing how to utilize in ways that are effective for them. Self-compassion and self-care. Um, and one of the big things that we talk about, I talk about with my clients, is being able to give themselves permission to be. Ah. And this is what's being huge, to be wherever they are and to be able to accept whatever thoughts and feelings come with that, whether they're comfortable or not comfortable, without judging them to be able to just acknowledge that this is where I am today or in this moment without striving to be in a different place. Now, we might ultimately need to decide what do we want to do with those thoughts and those feelings. But to first just acknowledge that they're there and that they are meaningful and that they're a part of your authentic experience without criticizing yourself for feeling that way or for having those thoughts. So self-compassion is huge. And again, the giving themselves permission, giving themselves permission to re-engage in the life that they desire, that they deserve. And so one of the major features as far as being able to evaluate the end of therapy is for clients to really be able to, I think, one, unpack the things that they have been carrying and to be able to discern what doesn't belong to them. Uh Because that's important. We all have a bag that we're going to pick up and that we're going to carry with us, but it's ideally it's lighter and it's manageable and it's something that we aren't enduring um, in ways that are harmful to our overall self-care. And so um, for clients to be able to identify what their needs are in different situations and how they can have those needs met, either being able to meet them themselves or being able to ask for support, um, really begins to signal the end of therapy. When clients are able to be and feel empowered um, to solve some of their own issues and to meet their own needs, Mm -hmm. Um, and to demonstrate that with compassion. And so we really talk about um, and and set clients up for success there, right? So are my expectations that I have for myself, the goals that I have for myself, realistic? And if they aren't, do I can I build capacity so that they are? Or do I need to really think about what this goal is? Um, And for some clients, the reality isn't, especially as it relates to grief, um, to not feel those feelings anymore, right? Mm-hmm. That often isn't the goal. But what do I want to do with those feelings? And we, we know that when we are able to honor the losses that we've experienced, some powerful things can happen. We know this to be true. We have amazing organizations that have come out of and been born out of tremendous loss. Um, many of our organizations around breast cancer and child cancer and things of that nature came out of grief. Um, and so when we find ways to honor the life that we still have, um, we likely are reaching a place where we can kind of do the thing um, with little less consistent support by way of therapy. Um, but also being able to utilize the support that we have in our day-to-day life. Um, and for some clients, that means connecting to people that we don't yet know um, and how do we navigate those conversations and those relationships. Um, And so I think compassion and self-acceptance are huge, Hmm. um, being able to use in our day-to-day life. Exactly. And mental note-takers, as you listen to Ajeta talk about these things, I'm wondering if you're struggling with any uh, feelings related to loss, uh, transitions, things that you've been carrying in your own bags uh, that that are weighing heavily on you. 
And if any of the things that Ajeta is saying right now make sense to you in looking at what is it that I need to do to lighten my load? Is there anything that I can do from a self-compassion standpoint that would help me uh, get through this or resolve some of these issues that I've been carrying for a long time? And Ajeta, as I hear you talking about these things, you know, it's it's one thing for you and I to talk about you know, point A to point B, what's the recipe for success? But I would imagine that there are a lot of challenges in working with clients who are going through these types of things. What are this what are some of the primary challenges that you experience in your work with these clients? Um, I think some of the guilt um, and the shame. Guilt and shame are, are huge things that show up. And whether it's about um, the guilt and shame about not uh, about the way that they're grieving or the way that they're managing the loss or not managing it, or even the guilt and shame around even coming to therapy are certainly our barriers that we experience and that we face. And so we have clients that um, <clears throat> are, are not ready um, to, to peel back some of those layers. Uh-huh. And this is really where self-compassion um, and acceptance come into play um, and become the real lived thing, is that we honor that that's where the client is. And really work to, again, unpack what they gain from being in that place. Right. Um, what the vulnerabilities are um, that might show up when we think about moving to a different space, when we think about not having to be protective of ourselves, because we've developed those skills. Um, and I find that the challenge or the resistance that the challenging clients that we have a gift of working with Um, really is fear. Um, And when we can peel back the layer of what they're actually saying and hear what they're not saying, what they're not able to articulate, um, and just wonder with them what it might be like if we didn't have to protect ourselves all the time, if we didn't have to always have the answers. Um, And if we could use this space, perhaps not to move them to a different place, because many aren't coming in ready to actually move to a different place, but to really understand where they are. Um, I think also allowing and acknowledging that the client is the expert is less about them buying into my approach or my philosophy as opposed to me understanding their worldview. And so when I give them space or create the space to do that, some of that resistance falls away naturally. Um, The other piece is consistency for me, um, with me being consistent, my clinicians being consistent in having compassion and unconditional positive regard for clients, regardless of what they're bringing to the table. And some clients bring some very heavy things. Yes. Um, and they can say some very hurtful things um, to get a reaction um, because that might be what they're used to. And for us to be able to reframe that and to continue to demonstrate that we know that this is coming from a place of suffering and that it isn't about me or how they feel about me. Um, when I allow myself to get out of the way enough and to just show up for clients, I find that the resistance to the challenges that we face are there um, really hard, right? And for, for some, the same challenging behaviors or thought patterns um, have served them in situations. So I think it's part of my responsibility to create safety so that they can see that they no longer need them, at least in this space. Um, and so it gives them the freedom, again, to put some of those old behaviors and old patterns and ways of being down, um, which for many is quite exhausting anyway. And so it can be quite, I think, liberating for some clients. Um, yeah. And then the other reality is, is that the approach that we have to doing this work isn't a good fit for, for some clients. And being able to be authentic in that, um, even if that becomes the case, we're committed and I'm committed to making sure that clients become aware of what their needs are so that they can then identify them in a, a clinician that might be a better fit. And so, again, it's about me as a clinician moving out of the way because this is their journey that I have the privilege of bearing witness to. Um, And if I can keep that in the forefront, then this work just becomes about serving people in the midst of their grief. Sure. And a lot of what you were saying um, is just really good clinical practice, isn't it, about using those basic Rogerian skills, about being authentic, about being nonjudgmental. I mean, all these things that we learn about in uh, in graduate school that, you know, I, and I think that I have 
I have taken those for granted uh, every now and then. But then when I really think about it, I think, you know, they have to be there. Th- those are so critical. Mm-hmm. Those elements, they're so basic, but they're so critical, you know. So I, I, yeah. I appreciate you talking about that and and letting the mental note takers hear that because we have a lot of graduate students who are listening to these podcasts. So so incorporating those and in, in having those in in every every uh, contact that you have with clients, I think is is so important. And well, now <laughs> we're at we're at this part of the interview agenda that I call make a mental note, and um, I call it this because I like to. Um, for the audience to make a mental note of something that you think is important in in terms of improving their mental health or their relationship. So if you could share maybe one tip or suggestion, some words of wisdom that you think might help audience members improve their mental wellness or relationships, what would that be? Building time to stop. Stop whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Build in time to be, to really focus on where you are, whether that is at work or at school, whatever it is, we are so busy that we don't sit with ourselves. We don't give ourselves the space to just be. Right. Um, we are constantly moving. Um, and when we don't take that time, we lose sight of ourselves. And so this is the piece that is, that's important. We are relational beings, but we have to make time for ourselves. And so it's okay to put yourself first, um, to create a space for you to just do nothing. Um, I ask my clients to find 25 minutes a day where they aren't listening to the shits. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. Uh-huh. And they really think what I would in in a perfect world, which we can create in 25 minutes, what does that look like if I just focus on me? We talk quite a bit with clients about the compassion and the self-protection that's needed in order to continue to do the things that we are passionate about doing that we do on a daily basis. And we know that it starts with us first having nurtured ourselves. And so 25 minutes a day, finding that time and that space to just do but to just be something that honors you, that uplifts you. For some, that's meditation. For some, that's yoga. For others, that's journaling without critique, without judgment. And to just give yourself that time and that space. It's important. I promise that it will allow you to go and engage with things that you need to do or that you have to do um, in a different way if you build in time to take care of you. And so self-care is huge always. Yeah. And that you deserve that time, and so give it to yourself. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I I was listening to that. I was I was thinking to my to myself that is that is so good, and for me that would be so difficult. And I bet other people would have difficulty giving themselves permission, as as you've talked about, to give themselves some time for self care. I guess, and it's so important. <laughs> but I know that you know in our society. It kind of gets back to the whole issue of doing, you know, we're kind of a doing society where we have to be doing things all of the time that to, to make that suggestion to a person, I bet it might, it might take them a little while to adjust and to actually put that type of uh, suggestion into practice. Mm-hmm. I often have clients that you know, are highly, highly, you know, MDs, PhD, highly educated people that have a lot of experience and knowledge. And I ask them, what do they do for self-care? And they tell me the things that they think they're supposed to do. So exercise, eat right, get good sleep. And I ask them, does that fill your cup? And, and that gives them great pause. Those are the things that you think <laughs> I would say, but they may not actually be the things that you need. Exactly. So stop whatever it is that you think you should be doing and do what you actually ought to do for you. And so give yourself permission to just do that. Stop. To stop the narrative, the story that you're telling yourself about what you should be doing. Right. And actually take care of you. That's that's fantastic advice. I like that. Well, Ajeta, if a potential client uh, wants to contact you, they're interested in setting up an appointment with you, how can they do that? Sure. So we can be reached by phone, and our phone number is 301 
1-800-273-8181. You can also make an appointment directly on our website, and it is www.f, as in Frank, I as in India, T as in Tango, hyphencounseling.com. So that's fit hyphencounseling.com. And we are ready and willing to walk with you on your journey. Okay, that sounds great. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. I think that uh, the listeners have, have likely gotten a lot out of this. And uh, just thank you for taking the time to do this today, Ajeta. Thank you for the invitation. It's been my pleasure. Okay. Okay, great stuff from Ajeta. And uh, here's my ma- mental notes takeaway from today's episode. The way that people grieve losses varies from person to person. And it's influenced by, by the nature of the loss, as well as uh, social and cultural and gender norms. And um, finding, finding meaning in losses, as well as self-compassion, are key elements of the grief process. Now, here's my question. In some cases, people who are grieving the loss of someone experience feelings of guilt. And what do they feel guilty about? Well, Ajeta mentioned that people may feel guilty about not feeling sad enough about a loss, or perhaps feeling guilty about enjoying life, or not being able to pick up the pieces and know what to do next. All of these are common experiences that counselors can help clients work through. Okay, when you get a chance, check out my website, chrisquarto.com, for the show notes for today's podcast episode. I'll only be posting a few more uh, Make a Mental Note podcast episodes after this one um, before my new podcast series starts. And it's going to be so cool, especially if you're interested in starting your own private practice. So keep listening to find out more. Thanks for listening and have a great rest of the week.